I don't often read comments, but when I do, I'm always surprised by what I can learn about myself. I recently found out, for example, that I have fallen for the climate hoax and I'm an anti-scientific climate denier. That social media in a nutshell. I think a lot of people have a problem understanding me because they expect me to have an agenda. And if they can't figure out what agenda I have, they make one up. But the only agenda I have is that I want you to be well informed. And I'm pretty fed up with climate scientists who insist on overly optimistic messages about what we can achieve and with those who claim the world will end. It's time to get real about climate change. And the reality is that the Paris goals are long out of the window. At this point, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels is for our practical purposes important possible. Realistically, you can also forget about two degrees. Indeed, I think the Paris goals were never realistic in the first place. So what can we expect realistically? According to a recent survey by The Guardian, most climate scientists agree that the two degrees target is by now unreachable. Most of them think the realistic expectation is somewhat below three degrees. I don't think this is realistic either. Have a look at this infographic from the website climate action tracker. This shows the path that we are on, going by the average expected temperature increase and by current policies. If all the current policies worldwide would be fulfilled according to plan, we might just about stay below three degrees. Maybe you don't trust this source, but the assessment from the IMF looks pretty much the same. Current policies put us somewhere at the three degrees warming path. This is also what the majority of scientists scientists in the Guardian poll said. But is that likely to happen? Let's look at some examples and compare plans with reality. This is the European Union. This is the target for carbon dioxide emissions. This is the path we're currently on. This is Canada. This is their net zero goal. This is the path they're on. This is the United States. This is the plan. This is the path they're on. So what does it look like? Are we going to live up to the promises that governments have made and stay below three degrees warming? I don't think so. I've said this before, but just in case you haven't watched all of my 800 or so videos, the three degree estimate is just the average of the model projections. It's not like we know that this is what's going to happen. It could be less than this, but it could also be more. I suspect the reason some people call me a climate denier is that when I say this is likely going to happen, they think I'm saying that I want this to happen. No, no, these are two different things. Let's take the example of carbon dioxide removal. Fact is, all current plans for net zero by 2050 require carbon dioxide removal. The IPCC says so, the International Energy Agency says so, the US National Academy of Science says so, independent reports that have looked at it say so. The plans for carbon dioxide removal are completely unrealistic. We have a tiny fraction of what the plans require and it's never going to happen that quickly at that scale. Realistically, we'll pretend to do some carbon dioxide removal and fall way short of the goals. Does this mean I think carbon dioxide removal is a good idea or that it shouldn't be done at all? Certainly not. I just think that realistically it won't work. It's a similar problem with our glorious transition to electrified transportation. The International Energy Agency has said very clearly that the necessary grid investments are a critical hurdle in the adoption of clean energies. To meet the goals, most countries would have to put a lot of money into grid upgrades and get it done very quickly. Realistically, in most places, it's not going to happen as quickly as will be necessary. Does this mean I think we shouldn't do it? Certainly not. I just think that realistically it won't work. Or take the so-called hydrogen economy that some countries, including Germany, have heavily banked on. The idea is that we'll store renewable energy in hydrogen, which we can then use whenever we need it. Nice idea. 
But where do we get this hydrogen from? Here are the plans for such hydrogen from renewable energy projects versus reality. The plans for 2030 are in light pink. Reality is the black dots. The dots are kind of hard to see because they're so small. To give you some numbers, the European target for 2030 is 120 gigawatts in installed capacity. Operational at the moment are 0.2 gigawatts. Do you think the plans for a hydrogen economy are realistic? I don't think so. Does this mean I'm against hydrogen? Certainly not. I just think that realistically it won't work. For me, the relevant question is this. Why do we have so many bullshit plants? I think it's because the people who make these plants don't take the situation seriously. If you're in a serious situation, you give clear and simple orders. Do this now. You don't fuck around and waste time on 20 different things that, hey, would be pretty cool if they worked, but probably won't. If I was in charge of the world, I'd... I think I would step down. I've tried a lot of science magazines, but most of them I found either too flaky or too politicized or just not up to date. If you know what I mean, I recommend you check out Nautilus, which has become my favorite science magazine. Nautilus has both a digital and a print version, and it's just a pleasure to read. They really put a lot of effort into writing and the graphic design is top. You notice immediately if you open the print version that it's a high quality production. I've written several contributions for Nautilus myself, the most recent one about John Oppenheim's theory of post-quantum gravity. But I enjoy this magazine because it tells me what's going on in other scientific fields. What I particularly like about Nautilus is that they cover all areas of science, from astronomy to economics, history, neuroscience to philosophy and physics. They tell me what I need to know. You can join Nautilus as a digital-only member or get a print subscription. In addition to full access, to all the stories in Nautilus, members receive benefits like priority access to events, exclusive products and product discounts, and of course we have a special offer for our viewers. If you use our custom link joinnautilus.com slash Sabine, you'll get 15% off your membership subscription, so go and check this out. Thanks for watching, see you tomorrow.